He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. People don't sing that song much today. Is it because his hands seems odd to say, since we say Father, Mother, God when we pray? Or is the world too slippery to stay in our hands? Has it slipped away? I don't sing that song much anymore because I don't know what to do with my hands. My hands have forgotten their story, their agency, their glory. Their magnificent days held high above my head in praise. Almighty Oba, first wife of Shango. Almighty Oshun, Orisha of love and beauty. Almighty Yamaja, mother goddess of women. To African goddesses, I sang my respect. I danced head high and body erect. To the beat of dark feet on the red earth of my youth, I danced our freedom, our beauty, our truth. My hands swept and my hands gathered, harvesting what grew and mattered. Hands that clapped and hands that pounded. Hands over my ears as the rifles sounded. Hands up. We surrendered or we felt the whip's pain. Hands up. We surrendered. Thrown together, hands chained. I resisted enslavement, and oh, how I tried to break the chains, to run, to keep myself alive. Olukan, great Orisha of old, patron of all the ancients sold. Olukan, my parched lips cried. My hands were bloodied. My soul had died. My spirit was caged, heart clenched in fear on a ship's deck, packed like cargo, we watched Africa disappear. My hands hid my nakedness on the auction block, hands crossed and tied above my head in punishment, hands toughened and pricked by picking cotton, hands that nursed and soothed my master's children, Hands that sewed freedom quilts and hung them high on the line to send a runaway's message. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. I was not content in servitude. Hands that held Harriet Tubman's rifle, hands that penned Phyllis Wheatley's verses, hands that ran Ida B. Wells' printing press, hands that baked pies to save Mary McLeod Bethune's school, Hands that jazzed up the Charleston and pounded gospel and tickled boogie-woogie on piano keys. Hands that typed Zora Neale's manuscripts. Maid's hands, stiff and bruised with pain. Hands that flew Bessie Coleman's plane. Busy, busy hands filled with yearning, slowly learning to reach a cross race to slowly, so slowly, touch and embrace willing hands of white 
yellow, brown, and red, whose palms outstretched and fingers spread, we grasped those hands and clasped them to our chests and sang from one collective breast. <laughs> Angela Davis's hand in clenched fist held high. Fannie Lou Hamer's finger that pointed out the lie. Mae Jemison's hands on a spaceship's control. Beyonce's hand waving demand in her band of gold. If you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it. <laughs> Hallie's hand clutched her Oscar. Serena's her racket. B. Smith took an egg to a bow ledge and cracked it. Michelle Obama's hands in fist bump and high five. Hallelujah, we said. These hands show we have arrived. Our post-racial hands laid there idle, sans care. Soft, manicured hands stroked our long, store-bought hair. <laughs> our hands held our iPhones, sent emails and texts. So our hands went a flutter by what happened next. When young Michael Brown, his hands empty, his hands bare, was shot dead in the street and just left to lie there. And we've all been caught red-handed with our hands in the cookie jar, safe in our brick houses, slick in our smart cars, drunk on the illusion that we've come so very far. We've been blinded by trinkets and drugged by the lies. Now an unarmed kid's shot, and we're stunned and surprised. Now an unarmed kid's shot, and every one of us dies. <laughs> Fight? Should we cower? Take a stand or just run? Now our hands feel so naked without a knife or a gun or a mace or a molotov or a taser to stun. Because after 400 years, we are back to square one. And these hands we thought filled with our fine victories, now turned palms out above us, begging, please don't shoot us, please. If the system's still broken, is this plea a mere token of a rage yet unspoken? If it's justice we lack, is it defense or attack when we shout, fists up, fight back, fists up, fight back? It's all in our hands, all we can and cannot handle. It's all in our hands. what to do with our hands.
Well, thank you to Colleen and thank you to Jody, who are best friends since junior high, uh, as I've learned. And you can see. I've now seen that performance quite a number of times, and it never fails to move me uh, profoundly. Uh, I would invite you to go on our website at American University, and you'll see a filmed version uh, of Colleen and Jody's performance. Uh, and as I say, it never, never fails uh, to move profoundly. What I'd like to do now is to offer an opportunity. Uh, Colleen and Jody were interested uh, in hosting a talk back uh, with the audience, if you will. And Colleen, I think you were going to start by offering some reflections on um, the first time you performed this piece and uh, some of your experiences with doing that. And then we'd invite questions or comments uh, that you might have. So Colleen, the floor is yours. Sure. First of all, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. And um, before I started, I looked out um, among the crowd and I thought, these are the soldiers. This is a room full of soldiers. Um, and, and it's a time when we are close to being at war, all of us soldiers in here. So it's particularly moving for us to perform this piece here. Um, right after the Black Lives Matter movement started really gaining traction and publicity. One of our local theaters, Forum Theater, uh, gave me a call, their artistic director gave me a call, and Forum Theater is set up so that um, it's true to its name. Whenever there's a performance, there's a talk back after each show because they believe that, that theater can do that in a way that um, other public events can't. So the artistic director said, we're having a night about Black Lives Matter. Uh, in two weeks, can you create something? Um, and there are going to be a couple of other artists. Yes, there are artists in the room because you're chuckling. <laughs> so I had, I had been stewing, and, and uh, as, as we all had, about what was happening in our country and so forth. I said, okay, so this gives me a deadline. So I said yes. And the next thing I did was call Jody, who we met when we were 12. <laughs> and I called Jody, I said, I'm, I'm working on a, a piece, I've been invited to do this piece, would you play cello? She said, absolutely, send me what you have. And I said, I, I don't have anything. <laughs> so she said, well, let me think about some things musically. And I said, I would think about some things. And, you know, um, uh, it, it just happened that I had been thinking so long that when it, when it came out, it came out whole. And so we met together and um, I said it, um, I did the piece and she shared her music and we put this piece together. We, uh, the way Forum Theater works, you arrive at seven o'clock in the morning, you tech in and that night is the performance. We arrived to discover that the other people who were on the bill with us were these incredible, incredibly young hip hop and spoken word artists. We were the oldest people <laughs> on the program and Jody was the only white person on the program. So we stood to, to get a picture taken and um, uh, one of the young uh, um, hip hop performers said, you know, well, uh, indicating Jody, let's, let's make sure to get her in there. I said, yeah, let's make sure to get our token in there. And so she said to me, that's, that's kind of harsh. I said, I've known her a long time, so she knows I'm, I'm teasing her. So we performed that night. More people, it was a Monday night in November. I thought nobody would show up. The house was just about filled, and a hundred people stayed for the talk back. And it was amazing to hear what young people said. And I, I want to go back to the title there about narrative. I wrote this piece because I had to. I had to find a way to articulate what was going on with me. Never thinking about whether people would understand, whether this was so personal people wouldn't be able to connect, particularly young people. I said, well, they're not going to get it. They don't know these names that I'm talking about. And, and what surprised me was the reaction among young people. And once again, I was reminded of the power of telling personal stories. So when AU decided to have a teach-in the following January, um, 
the planning committee said it would be great to have an opening event that the whole conference could talk about. And so um, Mary and Fanta Av, fabulous Fanta Av, and said, do you have anything? Do you know anything? I said, well, Jody and I have done this piece, and I met these fabulous spoken word artists. Can we come and perform? And again, it was a gloomy, rainy Saturday morning. Uh, we started cold. something. <laughs> cold. And we started at like 8 o'clock. I said, There's, no students are going to get up. The place was packed, and they stayed throughout the day. Again, reminding us how, how hungry they are for these kinds of interactions. So um, uh, we had a wonderful day, wonderful discussion. About three weeks later, I'm in my class and I get a call from the provost. And sometimes that's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I reacted just like a school kid. I said, oh my God. And he invited, um, he said, would you and Jody like to videotape this and put this on the AU website? And again, I was just, I was really surprised. I was, my provost, I said, okay. And uh, we shot it in the space of a couple of hours. And um, uh, again, it's just been very interesting to see how people have responded and performed. And, and over the, the, the time of performing this, uh, we have gotten to understand a little bit better what was going on in our own minds as this was happening. So I want to turn it over to Jody to talk a little bit about her process. Uh, it's, it was wonderful to perform this for you. Um, every time is different for us. Um, for a lot of reasons, and part of it, of course, is who we're performing it for, and part of it is because we hear the piece differently, different times, and part of it is because the world has changed in the course of the time that we've been performing it. So, um, being back to square one in the piece is, has a whole other meaning to us now that it, than it had a year ago. Um, and um, one of the advantages of being a, a musician is that um, I don't actually have to change any of the notes, but I can react to what's inside me and what I'm hearing from Colleen. And I find every time there's something else I feel like I'm saying to myself about it, to Colleen about it, to the audience about it. And um, I also feel like it's a very, very special position to be in as a white person to um, be both a part of it and, and somebody who can react to it and somebody who can explore the extremely painful and conflicted feelings that everybody goes through. I mean, when Kelly asked me to come up with some music for it, I, what I was looking for was um, really the most personal thing I could find, and at the same time, really Kelly's words. It's a, it's a really magical process that we've been working on for a number of years, and um, so I, I feel lucky to be a part of this piece and lucky to be a part of the conversation about this. Um, that's Good, and we were hopeful to hear some of your questions or comments, and if you can come to the mics, they're towards the front of the room, and share with us your name and where you're from, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. My name is Gabriel Emeka. Um, I work in TRIO Student Services at uh, Evergreen State College. I work for Upward Bound, um, uh, helping first-generation low-income students, primarily of color, succeed in college. And um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much. That was a, a brilliant uh, piece, and it resonated very uh, deeply within me, and I'm sure everyone else. Uh, the, the question that I would have is, when, when you say that um, the way that 
that you perform it or the way that you hear it changes in the way that the world changes. And you, and you pointed specifically to being at square one. Um, I would just like to hear you elaborate in what ways do you feel that we're at square one even more now than we were a year ago? Thank you. People are hitting people. <laughs> people are hitting people. People are encouraging, leaders are encouraging people to hit people. That's nursery school. And people are encouraging people to hit the other. And that is 400 years ago. Um, I first met Jody in 1962, and we went to a very progressive school, private school in Greenwich Village, and the world was going nuts in 1962. But, but there was a sense that we were moving to a place where people could talk, moving towards a place where people could find some kind of common ground, and you, moving to a place where we could use our intellect and our sensitivity and our humanity to connect with one another. And a year ago, I would have said to you, back to square one, well, it's, it's more metaphoric than anything else. Today, it's literal for me. Um, when we are looking at television and seeing people hitting one another, um, that's a very, I feel we're in a very dangerous very dangerous time. Thank you. Um, I also want to add my thanks to both of you for that beautiful, beautiful production. It was, it is moving, and I can see that each time you perform it, each time someone sees it, um, it has different meaning, different impacts, and so forth. So thank you. And like the um, man who spoke before me, the thing that struck me was, um, oh, and I forgot to say who I am, sorry. <laughs> um, the thing that struck me was the, we're back to square one, the, m most deeply. I'm Sharon Parker, I'm with the University of Washington Tacoma, and I'm a long time um, devotee of AACNU and its work. So. Uh, again, you've just shown why. Um, but I want to say, um, I always react very strongly when there's a connection made to slavery and today's time, because we're not in slavery. We're, we may be very much oppressed uh, as people um, from racial, ethnic backgrounds in this country um, that aren't in the majority. Um, but we are at a different place. And I think I see it differently today because I am a very mature woman. <laughs> I've been in this work um, since the 1980s. And um, I have seen the circle go around. And I've seen new leaders come up. And I am so thrilled by the leaders I see today, the young people that you were talking about, who understand the names, who understand the historical references, who understand and bring new meaning to those connections, um, and who are leading uh, us in new ways of connecting with one another. Um, I see a lot of connecting. I just, um, this room, all of us connecting in marvelous ways and for the rest of the time we're here. Um, so I just wanted to say that Back to Square One has a really different meaning for me. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you and if you'll share your name and where you're from. Sure, I'm Pamela Tudor. I have a diversity and inclusion consulting firm called Tudor Consulting. I'm from Philadelphia and actually another old friend of Jody's and recently met Colleen. So first of all, 
It was really extraordinary. I just tell you from the bottom of my heart how profoundly moving, it's not the first time you've heard it, but how much it really touched me. And doing this work for over 20 years, I often feel frustrated and unsuccessful at getting to people, reaching people, to help them see not only how we're all connected, but the benefits, you know, in, in the work that I do in the for-profit world, where, where it's so much a matter of dollars and cents, you have to do some selling job to help people, help leaders understand why this is such a good idea. And it's actually also true in the nonprofit world that I work in. So having this experience tonight and adding that up to how many different ways and times I've tried to reach people, it really struck me that the work that you do, poetry, spoken word, and music, affects people so much more than words do and benefits and data and statistic, statistics, because I think you really can get to people's inner life and soul and the, all the stuff that counts inside. So I was reminded tonight of uh, after 9-11, and I'm from New York, so I, was, I had just moved to Philadelphia, and after 9-11, how broken I felt and um, it wasn't until the concert on the Friday after it happened and hearing Bruce Springsteen sing that I felt that I could begin some healing around it and it was music that got me there. So I just think that your work should be the top of so many programs and if you can't be there in person, perhaps the video, I know I'm going to incorporate it, because I think that you get to some place in people where you can open them up so that you, we can have the conversations we need to have. So thank you. Thank you. Colleen had mentioned uh, when she was speaking before that Colleen and Jody performed this piece at the start of a retreat that our students hosted uh, last January at AU. And just as you've said, uh, Carol, it was so affecting uh, in terms of setting the mood and setting the contemplative openness and reflectiveness engagement. It was powerful. And nothing, I think, could have created that opening in the way that this piece did. So thank you. And I think there was another comment. Very good. Hi, um, my name's Ryan. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I do academic technology at the University of Richmond. Um, and I really appreciated the emphasis on hands in your presentation. I think sometimes in higher ed, we focus on voice and on speaking and on talking and not necessarily on action and doing. Um, so especially in this context, I really appreciated that, that focus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, a couple more. I have a different kind of comment to make. And it, uh, first of all, thank you for your performance. And Kayleen, I guess one of the things I'd like to talk about is perhaps in what got me triggered, with, bad word, what got me thinking um, about it was the reference to slavery and how far we've come. And I don't know if we have. So I guess maybe I might be disagreeing perhaps with the idea. Um, because I think that your reference to slavery is very important and very appropriate. If we look at so many texts that have come out recently, certainly slavery by another name, um, listening to Brian Stevenson, even going back to our history and knowing that while, we are, while slavery ended, it was ended completely except for one, for one in one instance, and that was if you were jailed. And when we begin to look at the impact of the criminal justice system on African Americans today, when we, and if you read Michelle Alexander's book, and we think one out of every, every three African American boys are going to be part of the criminal justice system, I think that when we talk about that we've come far, perhaps in terms of personal relationships, but we really need to talk about systems. 
And I think that's really what we're here to begin to take apart because we can keep changing individuals, but the individuals will change, but the systems, that which is creating the, you know, the, the, the poverty, creating you know, the criminal justice system, creating the boxes that we can't get our students out of, really need exploring. So keep talking about slavery, keep talking about what goes on, because that's really where the problems lie. <laughs> couple more comments and then uh, we're going to move on to another element of our program. So, sir? Yes, very good. Hi. Um, first, I thought that was a very, very beautiful, very moving piece that you guys did. It made me really think, personally at least. Um, oh, um, sorry. My name is uh, Abenezer. I'm from the University of Denver. I'm actually a student. Um, and really, I had a question. And as I was hearing you uh, talk earlier about progressing, moving forward um, in 1962, you know, when you we went to a very progressive school, um, you know, I go to the University of Denver. Um, it's a small private school. Uh, I'm very fortunate to go. Um, however, sometimes when incidents like uh, the Michael Brown shooting and a lot of these incidents occur, to have the conversations on campus it seems difficult. Um, it feels like you're in an environment where you're moving backwards more than you are forwards in terms of open communication uh, and being able to face your demons and being able to actually talk and have a coherent conversation with one another. Um, a large population of my school is um, is white, and you know that's and they're very affluent. A lot, a lot, uh, a large population, um, and it's difficult to not make them or help them understand, just for them to understand um, your train of thought and to understand you know, where you're coming from and why you feel a certain way. And I, I really, I just wanted to know, how, how did you personally, you know, when you said you had those 100 students come um, for those conversations, how did you help them understand, make them understand, um, and have like a better conversation and have a more logical, coherent conversation? Wow, that's a, that's a wonderful and, and profound question. I, I think, uh, and I, I want to uh, turn the mic over to you, Jody, as well, but when we, uh, we recently performed this at Stevens College for their Martin Luther King weekend, and we talked about how we started working with one another, because we've known each other since we were 12, but there were long periods of time when we didn't see one another, and we only really started working together as artists in 2011. So we haven't really been working together as artists that long. And the way we started was by having sort of conversations about how are we going to do this. We knew we wanted to get at some of the stuff that's difficult, but where do we start? And we started by sharing playlists. She brought in the songs that were important to her growing up. I brought in the songs that were important to me growing up. What we were saying to the students of Stevens College is sometimes you don't start with the hard stuff. Sometimes you start with the very personal stuff. You know, what was it like the first time you had a birthday party you could remember? What was it like to have a crush on somebody and to find the moments of humanity that you can talk about and share? And I think this is what is so frightening to me is because in those rallies where people are getting hit, and many times people who have not said anything, <laughs> nobody knows anybody. Nobody, you, you, you don't know why those four young black men were attending a Trump rally. Nobody asked. Nobody asked. They didn't have a chance to say anything. So as you said, making those spaces, before you talk about the hard stuff, to just talk, to just listen. Um, and the classroom and the theater and the concert hall are one of the few places we have anymore, and conferences where we can talk and, and listen. So that, I think, as educators, that puts even more pressure on us to create those spaces where before you get to the hard stuff, just, just talk. Um, uh, through Kelly, and I've been involved in some very, um, uh, scary conversations recently that 
where it becomes very, very obvious the amount of, the amount of um, effort that you need to put into developing some really genuine trust. Um, otherwise, you know, you're asking people to do something to cross over all kinds of lines inside themselves that they're not ready to cross over. So, and it happens that we both feel pretty strongly that the, that the arts make that easier to do. Um, storytelling makes it easier to do, um, and Kellyn is wonderful at drawing out people's stories. Um, and everybody wants to be listened to, so if you can find a place where you can have those conversations without immediately going into the scary spaces, uh, that's the place to start, I think. And, and, and doing music together, I think that's always a good place to start. So great, let's hear from those who are standing and then uh, Angie Chuang and I, we're gonna offer some reflections on things we've been doing at American and we'd like to hear your thoughts uh, on them. Yes? Thank you, hello. Hello, okay, hello, my name is Felix Rapith and I work um, for the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. And <clears throat> when I think about the title of, of this conference of diversity and learning and student success, like. That's something that's the core values of pretty much all of our institutions that we work for, right? And, we, and we're proud to say that's what we stand for. But when it comes time to take those words and put them into action, in particular when it comes to the issues that we deal with with race, it's met with all type of uneasiness, right? And if we were to just straight up bring, up bring up the issues that our students and staff and faculty are facing on our campuses, it's often deflected by other things that are encompassed in the word diversity, which, which often never allows us to deal with the root of all these oppressions and systems that are negatively affecting the folks that are, the students that are feeling the, our campuses today, right? <clears throat> and so when I heard the folks up, up there to say, we're the, we're the soldiers, right? We are the soldiers. But how many of us are, have what it takes to win the fight that we're gonna have to take on or continue to push forward when we go back to our campuses? Right? Because the outcomes aren't getting any better despite putting those words into our mission statements and strategic plans. You know, despite hiring a chief diversity officer, despite adding in a, a, a particular course. So my question is, what is it really gonna take to get the changes systemically that need to happen. Or else, all this is is a conference and diversity is nothing but a commodity that the institutions are using to continue to generate something that's not doing anything for the folks that we should be here to fight for. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So yes, thank you. I wasn't sure if someone's really going to take that on, but um, kind of building off of that, my name is Tiffany, um, and I come from many different walks that I feel influence my knowledge now. Liberian American, raised in Staten Island, went to school in rural Indiana, went to grad school at Syracuse University, now work for the Posse Foundation. And my question and thought and thing that I continue to grapple with is figuring out what it means to uncover these truths in students um, and then leave them to fend for themselves. So who are we protecting when we create these spaces and, and, and who, are, who are we actually allowing to be in these spaces? So in, in my work, we do something called the Posse Plus Retreat where we, with our partner colleges, go around and host retreats across campus, faculty, staff, students. Um, and this year's topic is language and speech in a diverse society. And it's responding to the need from students to have trigger warnings in classrooms. And so I think this really parallels with the idea of narrative and storytelling because we share these truths that people hold inside of them 
to what end? So my question is mainly thinking about when we do these things, when we do this work, when we have these stories, um, what do we hope comes from it other than exposing them? Um, and how do we equip students and people at large with this? Because this is happening in educational space, but my hope is that we're able to have these conversations with someone in the coffee shop, with someone in the grocery store. Um, if we only talk about this with people that we interact with every day, then what kind of change are we really talking about? Most importantly, what kind of change are we really talking about? What are we saying really needs to happen? And what are the tools that we feel need to be equipped? So my question comes about thinking about action-oriented thing, and it could be the generational part of me that wants instant gratification, but <laughs> my work does, we do develop curriculum, we do have dialogue around identity, um, but then we leave them to fend for themselves. Um, and whose voice are we protecting? Is it valuable to have, to be quite honest, the liberal, the moderate, the conservative voice? And what does it mean to have those voices coexist? And to me, that is the disconnect between a lot of the com conversations I hear happening in social media um, about why people feel like black life matters should be all lives matter. The idea that there are these racial undertones, there are ideologies that persist that bring the systemic um, oppressions. Not to mention that we continue to silence other voices. So I was very compelled by the piece, but then I think about, um, not to tokenize, but I think about my Latina friend, and I think about my Asian friend, and I think about my Native American indigenous friend that are not recognized at a platform like this. And so many questions, many thoughts, but ultimately thinking whose voices are we allowing to exist in these spaces? To what end? So what are we really saying we want to happen? Can we actually pinpoint what that is? And if you have a thought about that. Um, and um, what tools do we need to equip with? I'm just filled with so much. Um, but I'm at this point right now where I see lives in danger because of people, people's self-infliction of the harm that they put on themselves. Um, and of course, there's the other facing the other and then reacting. So I think my question is broad, but I'm concerned that we continue to bring up all of these things. And maybe it's just because of my experience, I'm in these spaces often. I'm concerned that we continue to bring up all these things, but we're not equipping tools and we're not really pinpointing what the it is um, when we say we're talking about it. When I referred to you as soldiers, it's because of those kinds of questions. Because when you do the work that you do, it's exhausting, it's frightening. When you ask people to open up, then what do you do with that? And what, what are the goals you're setting for yourself? Exactly, what is it? I think, I think we have to look very specifically at each person, at each group. I think one of the things that happens, at least with, with some of my younger students, is it's so huge. Where do you start? So they don't start. They don't start because they, there's no door, there's no doorway. One of the most important things I think of doing as an educator is just a doorway. Even if it's just a conversation at office hours, even if it's just um, a conversation that goes badly, I can't help but think that lives are being changed and transformed. Not on the massive level, people have, have been talking about systems. Absolutely, I mean, we understand the, the, the enormity of the job, but systems are created by and run by people. And I find what's frightening is we're spending so much time doing electronic stuff that we don't talk and listen. So I would say congratulations and I applaud you for enabling people to talk and from there you find a way, however rugged and difficult it is, but if we stop talking, I think then we're in real trouble. Good, so one more comment, thank you. I'm Daryl Johnson. I'm a professor at Kutztown University. It's about 55 miles up the road. And uh, I also work with the um, Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education Student Success Network. 
and I'm tired. I was really tired today. At, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I woke up and decided to drive to work, and my tire blew. And I walked three miles because I had to, to attend my storytelling class, because I also teach storytelling. And the reason I'm here is because I saw the word narrative. And for the first time, I'm not presenting at a conference, and my university said, we'll pay your way. Mm -hmm. The last class I taught today was one that I've been asking for the last five years, and because of some administrative things, I've not had the time to teach. But at 1.30 to 3 today, when I was really, really tired, I taught my section of music and the spoken word. So I didn't know that you were going to do this tonight. And in two weeks, Alicia Garja is coming to our campus. And I gave the students the prompt. We got rid of theater a couple of years ago. So the students that are in that class have never performed poetry out loud. And we're working in the section now. We actually start on Tuesday is integrating the spoken word with music. We've worked on poetry slams and poetry. And I gave them the prompt of blank matters. And I was unbelievably surprised at the beauty and the dignity after only five minutes of writing. I can't wait to show them your performance, and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you. I'm no longer tired. I now, <laughs> I'm now fulfilled. Thank you. And this last comment ties directly into the work of my colleague, Angie Chuang, so I'll be very brief uh, and then turn the floor over uh, to Angie. Um, as you have heard, we've been undertaking a number of efforts at American University, and I'm sure that's true of every institution here, uh, to try to meaningfully address issues of diversity and inclusion. And what I wanted to share with you this evening, again, very briefly, was uh, my experience uh, being new in the position of dean of faculty, uh, and just a couple months into that, uh, we heard of the grand jury's failure to indict in Ferguson, and immediately that evening we gathered uh, students in the dining hall, and we heard their expressions of pain and isolation, alienation, fear, uh, women speaking about fear for their brothers, men speaking about fear for themselves, so vulnerability, outrage. And we also heard within a couple weeks real disappointment on the part of students in their faculty's failure to address these issues in class or to address these issues on campus. And so the students were feeling even more isolated and alienated that their faculty were not helping them think through issues of race and gender and class. And so my colleague, Fanta Av, who Colleen mentioned before, uh, Fanta is the Assistant Vice President for Campus Life, and she knows AU like nobody's business. Um, Fanta and I went to visit all of the faculty departments. Uh, there are 28 departments on campus. And we visited each department while they were having their regular faculty meeting. And we called it our listening tour to the faculty. We called it our listening tour. To one another, we affectionately called it our ethnographic uh, study uh, because we found that there were marked differences uh, in character and temperament when you visited the math department uh, as compared to the psychology department as compared with the finance department, uh, and so on, and very surprising findings on our part. So we found, we uh, went to each of these faculty meetings, and we just sort of quietly said that we were interested in hearing faculty's thoughts about engaging with students on issues of race and gender and class. And then we'd sit back and we'd hear the faculty's thoughts. Uh, and there were some unifying themes, and I'll get to those in a moment. But then there are also some surprising findings. So 
in math stat, they were really with it, if you will. Uh, they were thinking about their syllabi and their reading materials and their problem sets um, to be reflective of concerns about diversity and inclusion. Likewise, the physics department was doing so, which you know, I brought my own bias, I suppose, to these meetings. Um, but then we were disappointed. Uh, in our meetings with other departments, departments that we anticipated would be more progressive and more thoughtful and more reflective. And so that takes me back to what we heard as sort of unifying themes in terms of faculty's sense of lack of expertise in dealing with issues, particularly of race and class, that the faculty expressed anxiety about being able to facilitate difficult conversations, conversations across difference. And they also, at the same time, articulated a, a wariness about expressing vulnerability um, in front of their students. And so the faculty expressed some anxiety about thinking through questions out loud, if you will, with their students uh, that, uh, that this ran counter to their understanding of what it meant to be a faculty member. You're to have the answers. You're to lead your students uh, in thought. And so we invited faculty to rethink that, if you will, and to think about the power of thinking out loud with their students in partnership as a shared endeavor um, and building trust uh, through that expression of vulnerability, through the opening uh, of the door uh, that Colleen uh, was referring to before. And, and what we heard from faculty, and I'll be very brief, um, what we heard from faculty was that they uh, would welcome some resources in helping them feel more comfortable in the classrooms, addressing uh, issues of difference, uh, facilitating conversations across difference, facilitating uh, what were often termed uncomfortable conversations. Uh, and so, uh, with our Center on Teaching, Research, and Learning, Marilyn Goldhammer uh, is our Associate Director right here in the front, Professor of Education, and Naomi Barron, who's in the back coughing from time to time. There you are, <laughs> Naomi. Uh, Naomi is a professor of linguistics in our World Languages and Cultures Department and the director of our Center on Teaching, Research, and Learning. And together, in partnership with others, uh, they offered a series of brown bag lunches uh, with faculty to hear more about what resources would be helpful to them. And then they began to facilitate workshops, workshops about inclusive pedagogies. So how to make classrooms more welcoming environments, uh, how to facilitate conversations across difference. And then they developed a website of materials about inclusive pedagogies, syllabi that provided language on um, how to engage in respectful conversations across difference. Uh, so many different initiatives in that regard. Um, my colleague Sonia Greer, who may um, be with us, I know she was teaching, there we go. Sonia was teaching this afternoon and has just joined us. Sonia suggested that our annual faculty uh, activities report ask a question about what faculty have done in furtherance of diversity and inclusion efforts on campus, uh, which not only is a useful way to collect that information, but obviously sends the message that this matters and this values, and I, as dean of faculty, review all these reports uh, and will place emphasis on those activities. Um, lastly, we hosted a series of unconscious bias workshops. It's one of the things that we heard from students that they wanted to see their faculty uh, undertake. So we had a series of unconscious bias workshops. 750 faculty um, participated in these workshops this fall. They were hosted by my office. And then our biggest event on campus uh, is our annual uh, teaching conference and the keynoter uh, focused on unconscious and implicit bias and 450 uh, faculty attended uh, that talk. So I 
say this by way of saying it's very much a work in progress and the work continues. Uh, and the work continues in part with Angie Chuang, who is helping us think through some new curricular initiatives around diversity. We are laddering a series of uh, courses that students will take in their freshman year and then again in their majors uh, that relate to issues of diversity. And Angie, speaking of inclusive pedagogy, has undertaken a very neat project in class um, that I'll let her share. So please uh, welcome uh, Angie Chuang, Professor of Journalism in the School of Communications. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. I think if there's a theme for um, some of the work we've talked about and seen tonight is that um, Often these things are not planned far in advance. They are not um, things that we've thought out completely as we undertake them. And we're undergoing this process with our students. And so even though I am part of a very ambitious curriculum in initiative, I've studied and written about race for really my entire adult life, both as a professional journalist, launching one of the first uh, regional race issues beats at the Oregonian in Portland um, starting from 2000 until um, I started at AU in about 2007. But, um, but the thing that I'm going to talk about tonight um, really happened on the fly. It was something that didn't exist on my syllabus that I sort of made up as I went along and it grew and it grew and it grew because of the work of um, some people in this room as well as um, other people on campus. and. I think it just shows that you don't have to know what you're doing going in. <laughs> that you just have to have the, um, the intention and I think the ability to say this may completely fail or this may um, uh, put me in a position to be very vulnerable. It might be the conversation that Colleen said didn't work out. But if we don't put ourselves there, we're not going to uh, find our way or it's going to be that um, feeling of silence that students often get from faculty and get very frustrated about. So what I was hearing on campus at about the time that um, we were having the teach-in and there were discussions about Black Lives Matter and what was happening in the country was that initially there was this idea that this was a, a general concern we had about our country, our society. And for many students, they describe this as, this is our generation's moment, defining moment. It's our Vietnam. It's our, um, it's our cause. And I think that was um, not always seen by faculty as something that was so important. And it was a difficult issue on our campus because it was one in which it was Vietnam for some students and other students felt like, am I really included in this? Can I be a part of this? Um, the word ally came up a lot. How can I be an ally? How can I be somebody who is a part of this? Or I think on the flip side, is this about me? When they say that, um, you know, that uh, there's white supremacy or there's oppression, am, am, I, am I the oppressor? And then on the flip side, there were people from um, Asian American uh, Native American, Latino cultures who were saying, well, where do I fit in this? It was, it was a tough moment. And then it became very localized and personal. Um, you may or may not know this. This happened on a lot of college campuses, but AU had its own experience with racist incidents. Um, it happened on social media. It happened on an anonymous forum. It um, made at least local news, probably some national news. It was very ugly. And what immediately happened was it became this national issue to something that was incredibly personal and incredibly close. And students said that they would go to class and they would look at the person sitting next to them and wonder, did they post that thing on social media that I read? Or was it, was it you? Was it you? And that really, um, I've taught a class on race in the journalism department for uh, eight years, and I had the most diverse class I've ever had uh, because of these um, wonderful recruitment um, efforts that our university has undertaken, and the least conversation I've ever had at a time when we had the most to talk about. So I had this class, everybody was feeling this very personally, they were very emotional, and they weren't talking to each other. 
So I got kind of stuck in the middle of the semester and wasn't quite sure what to do. And I decided to have them, um, I, I just gave them a bunch of pieces of paper with names of people who had died. Uh, Michael Brown, um, Ricardo Diaz Referino, Alan Locke, who's Native American. I included people from history like Vincent Chin um, from 1982, uh, Rodney King, um, I just anyone I could brainstorm. I had them each draw a name out of a bag and I said, let's research these names. And why don't we, we had just finished reading Todd Nahasi Coates, Between the World and Me. They had found that very moving. I said, why don't you, instead of doing a journalistic project or a research project, why don't you research that person so you can write a letter to them? Write a letter to them about um, how their death affected you, how their death affected um, what happened after their death, both in your life and in this country. And um, I thought it would last maybe a week or two, and we would move on to the next unit. And something happened in that classroom. Uh, they started coming to me and saying, I really can't write this letter about Eric Garner because I'm white and I feel like I have nothing to say to him, but I really want to write a letter to my brother who said that if Eric Bar Garner could talk, then he could breathe. And I was really angry at him. I think my brother is racist and I want to write the letter to my brother. Can I write the letter to my brother? Well, of course, yes, um, do that. Uh, a student came to me and said, well, um, my mother is an NYPD lieutenant and um, she's African American and I'm protesting the police. She's in the police and this has been a rift between us. I would really like to write a letter to her. I said, yes, of course, write that. And then she was going home for a fall break. And I said, why don't you ask your mom to write you back? So her mom wrote her back. And, and this just kept happening. Another student came and said, I've already finished my letter to Rodney King, and I want to write another one. I really want to write to Dylan Roof. And you know, the organized teacher in me said, well, Dylan Roof isn't dead, and he's not a victim of. And I said, no, 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 write it, write it. And um, she said it was one of the hardest things she ever did in her, in her AU career, was to write this letter to Dylan Roof. What we did was we uh, produced this book. Um, the reason why I produced this book was because um, the, right before my class, I got an email um, from um, Marilyn in Naomi's office saying, it's the last day for you to submit a small grant proposal for um, a class-based project. And I had known about this um, bookstore that does um, small-scale printing. And so I put in a $100 request to have a book printed of these letters because I thought they were so powerful. And when the students heard they were writing a book, suddenly they said, well, now we want to edit them and make sure they're really good. <laughs> and so I said, okay, why don't we all edit each other? So the students edited each other. I formed workshop groups. They talked to each other about their letters. They gave, I said, you have to help each of your classmates achieve their intention with their letter, even if you don't agree with what they're saying. If you fundamentally disagree with what the stance they've taken, then your goal is to help them realize that stance as well as they can, even if you disagree. And this was a very a productive exercise because for many of them, they found that difficult. But I think it was important for them to model a discussion about difference, a, mo a model a discussion about different views about very sensitive topics while working on a project that had a concrete product. And you would think that this very digital generation wouldn't care about a printed book, but they cared deeply about it. It was very, they all showed up when we, um, on, the day, on the day of the printing and wanted to receive the book off the presses. And then um, I'll uh, join all my colleagues in mentioning uh, Fanta. Uh, I ran into Fanta at another event and told her what I was doing and she said, well, you have to have a reading then. And so then we had a, a reading and I'll just leave off here because I know everybody's eager to get to the reception to say that um, we will talk more about that reading event uh, tomorrow at 11 during the uh, concurrent sessions, so that's my, uh, my pitch for that, and um, how that form of narrative, how the students connecting with this on a personal and emotional level, telling their own stories in conjunction with learning about these other people's stories was really the key to this exercise. And I blew up the syllabus. I dropped a couple other assignments. We worked on it until after the end of the semester, and I was dragging them in after winter break, um, after they got their grades, to keep working on this. And I think it was probably 
one of the most productive things I've done as a teacher, and yet it completely was not planned. And so I guess I would just leave it at that. I would love to tell you more about it and show you the book either at the reception or um, tomorrow at 11. I'll play one of the um, audio recordings of um, a white woman who wrote to Michael Brown and had um, gone to Missouri as an undergraduate and felt very emotional about the events um, that happened there. All right. Yes, yes, we are. We got another round, thanks to, thanks to Naomi. <laughs> Well, that was amazing. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of AAC and you for you sharing your story. The student who asked, or I'm sorry, you're an administrator, I think, right? Or a faculty member? Something. something. You're something. <laughs> he, said, he said he's something. I didn't say that. I didn't call him that. He, that's what he said. You're somebody. That's right. You are someone. You asked very clearly, what will it take? What will it take to make the change? And if you listen to the stories and what they just shared with you, I think having administrators and academic leaders and faculty members dedicated, really truly dedicated to making the difference and understanding the power of our students' narrative and what that means for your personal narrative and how you actually take your hands and institute and lead the change that we all know that we need in order to move our common and shared goals ahead. That's what it's going to take. And I thank you all for being here for this opening and for this conference. We hope that it's a start, a beginning, a renewal, a strengthening of the work that you're doing. While we're here, we're going to enjoy each other. We're going to fellowship. That's what we're going to do right now. We're going to have a wonderful reception. It's going to be right out here through these two doors. And I hope that you have a wonderful night. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at the post reception, which is right down below. Thank you.